Good evening, I'm Brenda Wood. Welcome to Dimensions of Prophecy with Kenneth Cox. Have you ever felt you were too weak to be a Christian? That when God passed out virtue, you must have been hidden behind the door? Does everybody else seem to be stronger or more capable than you are? Are you too weak to be a Christian? If you're able to identify with these problems, you'll be glad you tuned in to tonight's exciting and heartwarming topic. Perhaps someone has said to you, you must be saved or you must be born again. I'm not asking whether or not you've experienced salvation or if you knew what was meant by being saved or by being born again. Tonight's presentation, Too Weak to Be a Christian, is for you. When Pastor Cox has finished this subject, you'll never again wonder what it means to be born again. Now let's go to the meeting and join the crusade team and Pastor Kenneth Cox with his exciting, fulfilling presentation, Too Weak to Be a Christian. The young doctor had finished medical school, had moved out to the town where he was going to practice medicine, had found himself a office, a house that he had converted over into a office building, hired himself a nurse, a receptionist, set the date when he was going to open up his office and begin his practice. The day came, the nurse and the receptionist and the doctor all got there early, got everything all set up to start his practice in medicine. In a little while, an old gentleman came, came in, the receptionist greeted him. Uh, he asked to see the doctor. She gave him uh, some forms to fill out, kind of a case history, and the young uh, the old man sat down and very faithfully filled out all the papers, gave them back to the receptionist, and she told him that the doctor would see him in just a few minutes. And in a little bit, the nurse came out, called the old man's name, and asked him to come with her. And she took him back to an examining room and told him to have a seat. The doctor would be with him momentarily. The old gentleman had a seat, and pretty soon the young doctor came in looked over all the information that the old man had written down, and then he just began to take a case history, asked him a lot of questions and asked him what was troubling him and, and uh, wrote down different informations and did a physical on the old gentleman, took his temperature and his blood pressure and all that. And when he had gleaned all the information that he felt was necessary, he told the old man to just be comfortable. He'd be back in a few minutes, and he went in his office and sat down and began to try to diagnose what was bothering the old man. And he began to put together what he had learned in medical school and what he had uh, learned in his internship and everything. But in spite of everything that he would do, every idea he got, it just seemed to run into a brick wall. Nothing seemed to fit. And finally, very disgusted with himself, he walked back into the examining room and he asked the old gentleman, he said, you ever had this before? And the old man said, oh, many, many times, doctor. And he said, well, you got it again. And uh, when we take a look at the world, and we look at all the sin and the degradation and the crime and all, we can pretty well say, well, you got it again. What we're going to do today is we're going to go to the great physician, the greatest physician there's ever been, and we're going to let him diagnose our case. We're going to let him take a look and see exactly what our situation is, what is our spiritual condition. Now, there's a text over here in the Gospel of Mark, and it says it came to pass as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, 
I'd just like to say that if you know yourself today to be righteous, that there is nothing wrong with you spiritually, then I doubt that this presentation will do any good for you. Probably won't help you at all. But if you know yourself to be a sinner, then I think maybe what you hear today will be a particular blessing to you. Jesus didn't come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Now, you know, if you go to the doctor, and you can have something very, very minor wrong with you, you know, not serious at all, and you go to the doctor and you tell him what your problem is, what's bothering you, it seems almost invariably the first thing he does is take the stethoscope, put them in his ears, and listens to your heart. Because he knows that if your heart isn't operating right, well, probably not much else operates right. And when we go to the great physician, that's the very first place that he takes a look is at our heart. That's the first place he's going to look. And when he takes a look at our heart, this is what he sees. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So when he takes a look at our heart, he says that our heart is deceitful, it's desperately wicked, and that you and I don't even know our own hearts. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Huh? Haven't you ever said, oh, I wouldn't do that and then did it? Now, that, that's what I'm talking about. The very first place that he takes a look is our heart, and he says it's deceitful and desperately wicked. And after the doctor has listened to your heart, it seems to me that he always walks across the room, and there's a little white table about that high, and on it is a glass jar, and in that jar are some things called tongue depressants. And he takes one of those out, and he comes over and tells you to open your mouth and say, ah, and he takes a look in your mouth, that's the very next place that the great physician looks, is in your mouth. And when he looks into our mouth, this is what it says. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Said, you and I can't tame our tongue. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know, when the neighbor calls you up and says, did you hear about so-and-so? And you say, no, what about so-and-so? That's mouth problems. And that's what the great physician is talking about when he says the tongue cannot be tamed. It's an unruly evil. In fact, he says some things that are shocking. Listen. Their throat is an open tomb. Terrible. With their tongues, they practice deceit. The poison of apps is under their lips. I mean, he's not picturing a very pretty picture. Says we've got heart trouble. He says you've got mouth problems. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. So each one of us, he's saying you've got heart problems. You've got mouth problems. Do you know what the number one health problem of the world is? Hmm? What's the number one health problem of the world? You know what it is? Some say cancer, no. Heart disease, no. Number one health problem in the world is mental. Mental health is the number one health problem in the world. And that's the next place that the great physician looks is at our mind. And when he takes a look at our mind, it says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, he says that you and I have a problem being carnally minded because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God nor indeed can it be. So it says that our minds are against God. We want to go contrary to the Lord. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. In the days of the flood, the scripture says that was one of the major problems. For the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth 
and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Condition, a problem of the mind. You didn't know you had so many problems, did you? Got heart problems, mouth problems, mental problems. Now, what I'm trying to get across to you, folks, is I run on to people say, oh, Brother Cox, there's no hope for me. You know, when the Lord passed out virtue, I guess I was behind the door. There, there's just no hope for me. What I'm trying to tell you this morning is that there is no one that's strong. Not any strong ones. Don't let people fool you. I find some of these people that walk around with this very pious look, you know. The only thing is you just don't know what goes on behind closed doors. There's not any strong ones. We're all weak. We all have heart problems. We all got mental problems. We've all got mouth problems. That's the way we are. Someone may say, well, do you think maybe I could have inherited this from my parents? Well, the truth of it is, yes, you probably did. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. My mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden parts. You will make me to know wisdom. This is the way we, we are. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Huh? Man, when our kids were growing up and they did things they shouldn't, I'd tell them, you're just exactly like your mother. The truth of it is they're like their daddy. That's the problem, you see. But that's the way we are. We inherit those things from our parents. You, you see it. We come into the world that way. Now, the Lord tells us some very clear things about this. It says, you know, we would like to think of children as sweet little innocent things. You know, everybody loves a little baby and... They're so sweet and they're so innocent. That's not what the Scripture says. Sorry. But it doesn't say that. It says the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Have you ever wondered? I, I can remember when our kids were small. I couldn't figure that out. Because, you know, haven't you ever had Johnny come in and he's not very old and he tells you this great big whopper I mean, just gives you a big one like you can't believe. And you wonder, where in the world did he get that? Right there. They're born that way. Speaking lies. We come into the world with sinful natures. That's the way we are. People have to understand that. It, you, this idea that people are so, uh, some people have the advantage. No, no. We all have mouth problems and heart problems and mental problems. This is what it says about us. But we are all like an unclean thing. All our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf. Our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Even the good, our own righteousness, the Scripture says, is filthy rags. In fact, the Bible compares your spiritual condition to your physical condition. You, if you read the Bible, you'll find many times God makes a comparison between physical and spiritual. And when he looks at our physical condition and comparing it to your spiritual condition, this is what it says. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores they have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Not a very pretty picture, is it? it? says from the top of our head to the sole of our foot, there's no soundness in it. This is what Paul is talking about when he cries out these words and says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's what he's talking about. So we're all weak. There's not any of us that are strong. Now, when God created Adam and Eve, placed them here, they were fine, created them perfect. They didn't have mental problems. They didn't have heart problems. They didn't have mouth problems. They were, they were okay. God created them that way. That's the way he made them. He made Adam and Eve, 
to communicate with. That's what he made them for. He made them so that he could talk to them, that he could visit with them. He told them they could have anything there in the garden they wanted. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you what? Now, he told him, he said, this one tree over there, leave alone. Don't touch it. Don't eat of it. One scripture says, in the day that you do, you shall surely die. Now, God placed them here. As I mentioned, he made them perfect, made them beautiful. But God also wanted to communicate with them. You see, God is a social being. You ever thought about that? Why do you have children? You ever asked yourself that? Why have children? Do you have children so the children can love you? Or do you have children so you can love them? You see, we have children so we can love them because we're social beings. That's the way God made us. God is also a social being, and so he created beings so that God could love them. So he created Adam and Eve so that he could love them, that he could communicate with them. But the Bible says that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. So in order for God to communicate with man, he had to make man basically of two natures. He had to make man one flesh. Now, you don't have any trouble with that. You understand flesh, right? Huh? So he created them flesh, but he also gave to man a spiritual nature so that man could communicate with God. So man was made flesh, but he also had a spiritual nature. Okay. But Adam and Eve, instead of following what the Lord said, you remember Eve ate of the tree. She gave it to Adam. Adam ate. And it says that death passed upon mankind. Now follow me very, very carefully. When Adam and Eve Eight of that tree. Did they die? Did they die? Yes, they did. That day. Now I shocked you, didn't I? The moment that Adam and Eve ate of that tree, that spiritual nature that they had died right then and there, and all that was left of Adam and Eve was only flesh. The spiritual nature died the moment they sinned. That spiritual nature died right there. And all that was left was just flesh. And the truth of it is, when you and I are born into this world, we're born half dead because we're born only flesh. You see, that's all you can pass on to your children. That's all your parents could pass on to you was flesh. That's all, nothing more. They can only pass to you flesh, and that's all you can pass on to your children is flesh. And the only way you can get a spiritual nature back is you've got to be born again. So when Jesus told Nicodemus, you have to be born again, that's what he's talking about because Nicodemus was only flesh. And that's all each one of us are. And you've got to come to Christ and be born again to get a spiritual nature back. Otherwise, you only have a fleshly nature. Nothing more than that. Now, I run on to doctors, sometimes that don't have qualifications. You know, a doctor will come in and he will set up practice and he'll put out his shingle and begin practice. 
but he doesn't have the qualifications. He didn't go to enough school, or he's not qualified, and he's practicing medicine under false pretenses. Uh, we have a word for that doctor. We call him a what? We say he's a quack. I run on to some spiritual physicians that are quacks, for I hear them diagnosing people's cases. Let me give you an example. Sometimes I'll hear some physician, t spiritual physician, telling people that if you want to be saved, all you got to do is keep the commandments. That's all you need to do if you want to be saved is just keep the Ten Commandments. You ever tried that? Why, you might as well say, you know, jump over the moon. It'd be just as easy. Just as easy to say, jump over the moon. And I hear spiritual physicians telling people that when the Scripture says this, we know that the law is what? Spiritual. There's not anything wrong with the law. Now, let, don't make a mistake and get on the law. The problem's not the law. The law is spiritual, but I am... And I told you the other night what carnal meant. What's carnal? It means flesh. I am flesh sold under sin. You can't take someone who's flesh and say... Keep the commandments. Doesn't come that way. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. You see, it won't work that way. Another thing I hear these spiritual physicians not qualified say and telling people that if you want to be saved, all you got to do is think good thoughts. Boy, that is a choice one today. It goes around the whole country telling people that if you just think right, you're going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. You know, if you can just think right, you'll make it. Have you tried that? Huh? I can take you down here to the bookstore and I can show you at least 20 books that will tell you that if you think right, you're going to get into the kingdom of heaven. Man, I can remember when I said, okay, I'm not going to have any more thoughts like that. And then all of a sudden this thought comes from way back there in the dark blue yonder and slays me right there. Now, you're not going to think your way into the kingdom of heaven. can't do that. It says, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. You can't take somebody who's a child of wrath that's flesh and say, have good thoughts. Won't work. You've got to be born again. And particularly to young people. I hear them say to young people, uh, if you want to make it into the kingdom of heaven, if you want to be saved, just don't go to the wrong places. You know, stay out of those places if you're going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. You can't take someone who's flesh not spiritual, and say, stay out of those places. All you do is make them miserable. That's all. That's what Paul's talking about when he says, for the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. The old fleshly nature, that's what it wants to do. That isn't the way it comes. People that try to tell people to do this type of thing, kind of remind me of this billy goat. You see, this billy goat wanted to be a lion. He wanted to be a lion more than anything else. And one day he was trotting down this path and he came upon this monkey. And he and the monkey were talking and he told the monkey, he said, I sure would like to be a lion. And the monkey said, well, that's not hard. I can tell you how to be a lion. He said, if you want to be a lion, I can tell you how. And the billy goat said, listen, he said, I'll give you anything you want if you'll tell me how to be a lion. He said, no problem, I'll tell you how to be a lion. He said, if you want to be a lion, then you've got to learn to roar like a lion. He said, you're never going to be a lion until you can roar like one. Billy goat said, all right, any, anything else? He said, yes. He said, if you want to be a lion, you've got to learn to think like a lion. You can't be a lion if you don't think like one. He said, all right. He said, anything else? He said, sure. He said, if you're going to be a lion, you've got to eat like a lion. 
And so the billy goat trotted off to his home to practice on becoming a lion. I mean, every day he got up and roared. He practiced for hours roaring. And he tried the best of his ability to think just like a lion. And he ate lion's food even though he detested it. He ate it just the same. And after practicing for about a year and a half, he decided to go back and see the monkey. And so he trotted off back down the path and found the monkey. He told the monkey, he said, I want you to listen to me roar. And so he roared for the monkey. And the monkey kind of hung his head. He said, I think just like a lion. And he said, I only eat lion's food. And the monkey said, I'm so sorry. He said, I forgot to tell you one thing. He said, if you want to be a lion, you've got to go to where the lions are. Needless to say, the billy goat never came back. <laughs> you know, these people that seem to think that if you talk like a Christian, you think like a Christian, you eat like a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Let me tell you something, friend. That doesn't make you any more of a Christian than my setting in the garage makes me an automobile. The only way you're going to become one is you've got to be born again. Doesn't happen any other way. And the only way you're going to be born again is through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. You can't be born again any other way except in Jesus Christ. How does that take place? Let me quickly tell you how that takes place. There was a man by the name of Abraham. Abraham had never had any children, and one night as he was out walking around, the Lord spoke to him and said, Abraham, you ought to tidy things up around here because there's going to be a baby born. He said, who's going to have a baby? Lot's wife or one of the servants? He said, no, your wife Sarah is going to have a baby. He said, Sarah? Sarah's going to have a baby? He said, yep. He said, in fact, I'm going to give you a son, and your offspring will be like the stars of the heaven and like the sands of the sea. Oh, he said, that's wonderful, Lord. And he went running home, and he said, Sarah, guess what? We're going to have a baby. And she said, we are. She said, Abraham, you've forgotten something. I happen to be 65 years old. I'm past that time of life. Secondly, I've been barren all my life and have never been able to have a child. And he said, Sarah, I wasn't hearing things. The Lord told me we're going to have a son. She didn't. But Abraham couldn't accept the fact that he wasn't going. Finally, she said, I'll tell you what. Why don't you take my handmaiden, Hagar, and have a son by her? And so he had a son by Hagar. And the Lord said, Abraham, that isn't what I said. I didn't say a word about Hagar. I said, Sarah. Now, you know how much time's passed? You have any idea how much time's passed? 25 years. Sarah is now 90 years old. Abraham is 100. And he's sitting out there by his tent one day when the Lord and some angels come to visit him. And the Lord repeats this promise he made to Abraham. Now, you've got to consider that Abraham's 100 years old, okay? Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. Listen, he's restating the promise. And I'll bless her, and also I'll give you a son by her. Then I'll bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Now, listen carefully. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. <laughs> I mean, he's 100 years old. He just fell over and started laughing and said, Lord, what are you talking about? 100 years old and have a son. Do you know why God waited so long? Do you know? I mean, wouldn't 10 years been enough for 15? Why wait 25 years? Huh? I'll tell you why. Because Abraham took Hagar and had a son by her. 
And so the Lord said, okay, oh boy, if you won't listen to me, I'll just wait you out. And when you're so old you can't reproduce, then I'll give you a son. And that's why he's falling on, on his face and laughing. He said, Lord, you just waited too long. Can't happen. That's what's going on here. Shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who's 90 years old, bear a child? He said, what are you talking about, Lord? This is impossible. Sarah, she's inside the tent. She's listening to this conversation. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life and, below, and behold, Sarah, your wife shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah, what? Laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? Can you just imagine? Can you just imagine what would happen here today if some dear sister 90 years, got, years old got up and told everybody she was pregnant? Why, everybody would giggle and say, Bless her heart, she's senile. That's exactly what you do. Impossible, can't happen, but it did. It did happen. Now, what does this have to do with be born again? I'm going to tell you what it has to do with be born again because Paul picks this up in the book of Romans. Listen to what he has to say about it. Romans 4, verse 18, who contrary to hope, contrary to hope, uh, there was, I mean, he couldn't reproduce, neither could Sarah. In hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your seed be. And not being weak in, come on, faith, wasn't weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already what? Now, if there's some of you didn't believe what I was saying, there you are. It says that he couldn't reproduce. His body was already dead as far as the ability of reproducing. And I know what some of you dear saints are going to say later on. You're going to say, but Brother Cox, after Sarah died, well, he married Keturah and he had other children. You better believe he did because when God gave it back to him, he gave it back to him. Understand? So get it clear. Okay. Since he was about 100 years old and, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Listen, it tells you exactly what's involved here. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, what God had promised, he was also able to what? Perform. Get it clear in your mind. But God promises that you can be born again. He'll give you a spiritual nature, and what he promises, he can Form, write it down, don't forget it. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Oh, he said, the Lord promised it, I believe it, and God said, you have it. And dear friends, that's what God's saying to you. If you're willing to reach out in faith and say, Lord, I need to be born again, God said, if you believe it, I'll give it to you. That's what he promises. That's the only way you can be born again. Listen to this conversation with Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus doesn't understand that. He asked the question, he said, Are you trying to tell me I've got to be born of my mother the second time? And Jesus said, That which is born of flesh is flesh. No, he said, that's not what I'm talking about. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Two different things. Two different things. said, no, nah, Nicodemus, I'm not talking about being born of flesh. I'm talking about being born of the spirit. When you and I come to the Lord and by faith we accept him, the Bible makes this promise. Having been born again, all right, now how? Not of corruptible seed. That's flesh. Not of corruptible seed, but incorruption through the what? Word of God, which lives and abides forever. You see, that's how you're born again. He promised it here. 
through God's Word. He said, come to me, and if you come to me, you'll be born again. And if you come in faith, he'll honor that. And when you're born again, certain things begin to happen. A new heart also I will give you. Oh, that old heart that's deceitful, desperately wicked. He said, I'll give you a new heart. A new spirit will I put within you, and I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. Not only will he give us a new heart, he promises that he'll give us a new mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. In fact, he says that you become a new person in Christ Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, let me take just one quick moment because people don't understand what happens here at this point. When God gives you a new nature, you're born again, he gives that to you as a seed. A baby, it talks about it. It talks about it as a seed. When that baby is born, it takes what Pastor Simpson was talking about. It takes TLC, tender, loving care. Now, let me tell you something. The new nature, the spiritual nature that God has given you is one thing. The old nature, the old man of sin doesn't like the baby. Got to get that clear. And the old nature is going to kick that baby every chance it gets. And the only way the new nature is going to grow is you're going to have to feed it. And this is what you feed it with, okay? You've got to let it breathe. And the only way it can breathe is by prayer. Prayer is the breath of the soul. And the only way you can get it to exercise is by witnessing. And you've got to feed it, you've got to let it breathe, and you've got to exercise it. And if you'll do that, it will grow. Okay? Too many Christians that starve the new nature to death. And I find some of them that feed it and breathe, and all they do is get great, big, and fat and lie there. Need to exercise. It's all necessary. But he said, I'll give you a new nature. You'll be a new person in Christ Jesus. The story's told in Scripture that in Jerusalem was a pool called the Pool of Bethesda. It's still there today. It's, of course, in ruins, but you can go and look at it. It was built for the purpose of shepherds to water their sheep. It had porches that came out to the pool and the shepherd could bring his sheep in there and they could walk out on this porch and drink from this pool. As time went along, a legend developed about this pool. They believed that once a year an angel came, walked through the water, and as the water was disturbed and moving, they believed that the first person that got into the pool would be healed. So by the time Jesus is on earth, no longer do shepherds water their sheep there. Sick people lay lining that pool all around it. I mean, they're there by the hundreds. And they watch that water intently, hoping that at the slightest movement they can get in it, and be healed. Scripture says that one day Jesus came and walked out on one of those porches. Now just think, folks. Here stands the great physician. I mean, he's just come back from making a tour through Judea, and it says that he healed every sick person in every village. There he stands. All any one of those people would have had to have done is merely looked at him and said, Lord, help me. And they could have been healed. But instead, they're all watching the water. He walks over there to a man who's been sick 37 years. And he looks at this man and he says to him, Wilt thou be made whole? And he said, oh, there's nobody to help me, Lord. 
He said, when the water's troubled, someone always gets in it before I do. There's no one to help me. And Jesus looked at him and said, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. Oh, this morning, would you be made whole? The Bible says that you're born flesh, that you need a new nature. You've got to be born again. Will you, in faith, reach out and let Jesus make you whole? I want you to listen. As Steve sings, he touched me. Then tonight at 7.30, our presentation is entitled Adam's Mother's Birthday. Now, a lot of you are saying, I didn't know that Adam had a mother. But I promise you tonight, I will tell you who Adam's mother was. Tonight's a very special time. Also, we would like for you to wear something red. Wear something red tonight. Now, if you don't have anything red, don't stay home. But if you have something red, wear it. I don't care what you wear, whether you wear a red tie or red socks or, uh, you know. But if you have something red, wear it. Tonight's a special night. We'll have a very good time together. We appreciate each of you being here. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee so much that we can come to Thee and receive a new nature that we can be born again. That you have done everything that's necessary for us to receive the gift of eternal life. We ask that each one of us may place our lives in your hands, walk with thee day by day. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you at 2.30, then again tonight.